So hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's SEDS Online webinar. As always, we'd like to thank our sponsors from IAS, which allows us to offer all of these resources free of charge. This includes recorded lectures, learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So make sure you take a look at the website to get all the new info. Today's lecture is by Dr. Piers uh, lark -Holm, who is a sedimentologist and geoarchaeologist at the University of Western Australia. Dr. lark -Holm got his master's and PhD degrees from the University of Wales, and his research interests include the physical and sedimentary sciences of the environment, engineering, archaeology, and regulatory and policy work. So thank you very much for joining us today, and I will give the floor to you. Um, thank you, and thank you, SEDS Online, for, um, for letting me talk to everyone. Uh, so I'm just showing you, first of all, a, uh, a few clips from uh, newspaper articles and one uh, online article in Australia by the ABC, um, uh, which, which I'll refer to in a moment. But this was part of the publicity surrounding, in particular, one of the three papers that I'm going to talk about. Um, and that's quite beautiful there, I have some too. So, um, sitting next to me is uh, um, Ingrid Ward, um, I'm Piers, uh, Peter Ross from the University of Flinders may turn up online, Chris Foundry won't join us today. Um, the talk today is pretty much, a, it's a sedimentology talk and it's about, it's, it's analysing coastal archaeological artefact scatters um, in a coastal environment in northwest Australia. So that's the title, which I'll give you two seconds to read. And so this environment that we're looking at right now, this is the Burrup Peninsula, which is a discontinuous peninsula with a big bay on the right, Nickel Bay and a big sound on the left, another one, and some passages between these islands. And the three sites we're going to talk about are this one here, and for shorthand, I'm going to just refer to B2020, which is the paper involved that discussed this site. This site in the base of this passage, and this one on the bank of that passage. So those are the three papers that I'm going to talk about. And just for scale, that's 25 kilometers. So pretty much we're going to talk about stuff from Dampier out to Urgendre Island, which I always pronounce wrong, which is about 30 kilometers. Uh, in Australia, it's traditional to do an acknowledgement of country. So, um, Kea, Ija, Wajuk, Nungar, Guja, which means hello, this is Swan River land. Um, the Nungar people have a, a, a large territory across the southwest of um, WA, and we're in the Wajuk area. And uh, 1,200 kilometres to the north of us is Dampier, which is the site, uh, the area that we're going to talk about today. Which is where, which is called Muru, Murujuga, which is where the Aboriginal Corporation is. Um, stories from the stones. We'll be discussing some of those stones, and some of the stones are artifacts. These will come to those. Um, but note the scale of these. These are five to ten centimeters across, some of them a bit bigger. So they're cobbles and pebbles. And if I was an industry, I'd be saying, uh, "Here's my value proposition. My value proposition is that this talk will help you do two things." Uh, and I might just let you read those two things. And the third thing, which I hope you'll get from every seminar you go to, you'll consider maybe how to improve your own research. And in, in this case, I think as sedimentologists, um, there are opportunities for you to expand your future work. So these are the three papers involved. Um, the only thing you need to know on this slide that they're real, I just pasted them from the web, B2020, D2019 and W2021. About when these papers came out, these, these were basically um, proposing the first underwater cultural drowned cultural heritage sites in Australia. And they gained an enormous amount of publicity. For example, for B2020, this one here, there are 20 citations to date, today, in fact, 79 separate news articles. Um, it made the BBC News, ABC News in America, um, news all around the world. And of course, there are numerous Twitter feeds and blog posts. The problem is that if 
these, uh, if the publicity is uncritical, then we have the prospect of repetition becoming fact. And when we look at all the citations, all those news articles, everything just accepted the paper's claims. Uh, and I'll describe what those claims are briefly. Firstly, to B2020, and that's this site between the two small islands near the uh, northern edge of this archipelago. Um, they found in, uh, in a channel between these two islands, they found 269 artifacts, which they claimed as underwater and in situ, of which 169 they described as permanently submerged. And these are some photographs of the artifacts concerned. You can see the scale bar down here. So most of them between two centimeters and about 40. And there's an associated artifact in the base of Flying Foam Passage here at a depth of 14 meters. One artifact was found, also described as in situ, and that's a, a picture of it there. On the edge of that passage, there were several hundred artifacts discovered and published, and all of which were inferred to be in situ. That's a picture of some of them, so similar sort of size. So we've got the three sites, the one between the two islands here, the one on the base of Flying Foam Passage in 14 metres of water, and the one on the bank of Dolphin Island. Now, um, I realise I'm talking to sedimentologists, and here's the reason why. Geoarchaeology is really using earth sciences to enhance our understanding of archaeological sites and archaeological sites both in terms of their site formation through normal earth processes and of course post depositional effects so geoarchaeology in my view is sedimentology now there's two critical questions when we're analyzing these three papers the first one is are these artifacts underwater I, I'm not quite sure what underwater can mean. It can mean anything if you've got a big tidal range, for instance. But let's, we know what permanently submerged should mean. It must mean below, is, below lowest astronomical tide. So we'll test that. The second thing we'll test are whether the artifacts are in situ. And we'll come to a boring definition of in situ later. But clearly, the key question here is, can we rule out can movement of coastal artifacts actually be ruled out? Um, and there's four sub questions there, which I'll describe later, but pretty much modern hydrodynamic processes by humans at any time, during the Holocene high stand, which there is in this region, or during the processes of marine inundation. So we'll examine that question too. So are these artifacts in the water and are they in situ? Tiny bit of context, which I think is much needed. This is a sea level curve for the last 140 or 50,000 years for the last interglacial here, the last glacial maximum here in this region, last glacial maximums between 120 meters and 90 meters below modern sea levels, depending on how big you want your uncertainty to be. Our period of interest is the last 10,000 years. And in this particular paper here, they produce this diagram where the blue line represents uh, an interpretation from the oxygen isotope record and the red dots are coral reef um, uh, deposits in the area. I'll just expand that because it's helpful. So this is meters below present day sea level and this is age in years before present. And on the left hand side I've just put arrows in to denote the upper and uh, the range of elevations which the artifacts were found. This one's that northernmost one in the archipelago. This one's the base of the channel. And this one's the flank of that deep channel. There's a note in here. The one on the base of the channel, roughly, if, it's, if it was a, a terrestrial deposit of ar archaeological artifacts, it would have been drowned roughly nine ish thousand years ago. And the other two, anywhere between nine, eight, seven thousand years ago, the lowermost artifacts might have been um, uh, drowned by the rising post glacial sea level. Important to realize we've got a reasonably extended high stand here of uh, two or three or four thousand years, and then a gradual fall back to present. So that's the relative sea level changes, but 
there are other relevant water levels that I think are really important. First of all, the tidal range here is five metres. And we also know from paleotidal modelling, um, looking at the changing uh, interaction of the tide with the shelf during inundation, that it, the fat five metre tidal range was largely the same throughout this entire 10,000 year period. So first of all, we've got added five metre tidal range here. We've also got cyclones. During the historic period, we've got evidence for cyclones that have generated water levels, sea levels at the coast, eight metres above the sea level at the time. And we've got evidence through the Holocene from older deposits of up to 12 metres of water level elevation above the sea level at the time. So in actual fact, throughout this whole 10,000 year period, this whole period when these artifacts were around, we've had sea levels going up and down every day by five metres and episodically by perhaps two, six, eight or more metres. A couple of obvious things to say here. Along with this wide range of water levels, um, it's critical to realise that the artefacts are pebbles and cobbles. They're not easily transported. So it tends to be that we'll need to consider extreme events, cyclonic waves and cyclone driven flows. So that was the context. Let's get to our first question, are these artefacts underwater? So this is that peninsula and there are two sites, one here at the Dampier port and one here at, at the Cape, um, about 30 kilometres apart, where we've got many decades of tide gauge readings. So we're completely clear about our tidal elevations, highest astronomical tide, mean sea level, lowest astronomical tide. Note here that lowest astronomical tide here and here are exactly the same. They're about a centimetre difference. And that's to be expected in this environment. The thing I'm going to put in the middle is this site at B2020 between those two small islands. I'm just going to highlight lowest astronomical tide for a moment. It's given by B2020 in their paper. They assert that LAT is 1.25 metres higher than the lowest astronomical tide to the north or the south. So this means that oceanographically, their interpretation requires a bulge in the water here at low tide of one and a half metres. That's quite oceanographically challenging. I'm going to show you um, briefly um, a, uh, so this is, this is that little channel where the artefacts were found with a little island to the north and to the south. This black line is broadly the centre line. And my colleague Peter Ross in his PhD um, uh, analysed the depth of the bathymetry through here, this is the deepest part of the channel. This upper brown line is the average depth of the channel going all the way from west to east through that center line. And he's also plotted all these yellow marks, the lithic artifacts, the stone artifacts, both in location and elevation. So here's mean sea level, two meters above, two meters below, three meters below. Also plotted on here, uh, the tidal ranges for Cape, the Cape up here, that we know of from all the tidal records, neat, neat tide range, spring tidal range, highest astronomical tide, lowest astronomical tide. But this line is B2020 asserted lowest astronomical tide, which means that they consider all these artifacts as permanently submerged. This is a problem. First of all, as I said before, it's one and a half, two metres higher than elsewhere, which is oceanographically challenging. Now, I'm a scientist, so I don't like to say impossible, um, but I'm, I might think about it in this um, circumstance. Secondly, it certainly requires unsustainable ocean gradients. Between here and here, to have that difference in elevation would require a sea, a sea level gradient of one in 6,400. That's at least 10 and probably 50 times what you can generate in the open ocean. It's not realistic. So locally, using just those three sea level points, we can say that the tidal scheme that requires these artifacts to be underwater, or that can explain 
all these artifacts are in the water is probably unworkable. But let's look more broadly. Um, so I'm showing you a map here of, that covers about five or 600 kilometers of the Northwest Shelf. This is the Dampier Archipelago, and that's our little site that, with our assertion for LAT. I put on depth contours of 20, 50, and 100 meters. 100 meters is roughly the outer shelf, and then 200, 500, 1,000 meters. Um, let's imagine that the tidal wave comes in from the southwest, which indeed it does. So let's imagine, ignore the numbers for a moment, but let's ignore, let's, um, uh, let's imagine that's the, the beginning of the tidal wave approaching from the southwest, beginning to re be refracted as it interacts with the shallow bathymetry. Then I'll just carry it on. And you can imagine a wave um, refracting around these islands and growing perhaps in size as it approaches the coast. Yeah, that would happen with a, a wave. And if those were high tides, that would be perfectly fine, which it is fine. But actually, the, the sharper ones amongst you will see that these numbers are lowest astronomical tide. These are contours in, in meters, and these are negative. So what I've plotted here is the elevation of lowest astronomical tide made from uh, measurements at about 30 sites. Because there's so much industry on this Northwest shelf, there are sites all across the shelf. So we know that this data is correct. It's been recorded for the last 30 or 40 years. So clearly there's a big problem with a, uh, uh, an, L an LAT, lowest astronomical tide, asserted at 1.4 meters here. It doesn't fit. Let's so just let's to just emphasize that the tide approaches from the west and the low tide gets lower and lower and lower as we come close to the coast. So it looks like this. That's the low water here. So offshore in deep water, the tidal range is very small. The tidal range at the coast is very large. So the low water is very low. So regionally, their um, argument doesn't stack up. Of course, there's something local that we can do as well. We can just look at detailed aerial photographs of the area. And this is one of that, of that channel. And this aerial photograph was taken at a time of an observed low tide at the port of Dampier of minus 1.66 meters. It's not crucial, but quite a, quite a low spring tide. Um, just for scale, that's about 150 meters from bank to bank across this channel. A um, couple of things for you to realize. First of all, there's a big body of sand on the west and a big body of sand on the right and very shallow channel. In fact, there's a lack of open connection to the sea. There are also indications of algae in the channel, which you would not tend to get if a channel was well flushed by the tides on a daily basis. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this area here because we also have a drone image that we can look at. That's the image. And we, this image was taken when the tide was about 90 centimeters lower than that previous image. And we can see some faint here indications of transport on the channel bed. For example, up here, there are some rocks sticking out on the seabed with sediment tails to the top left as you see it. So I'm just gonna overlay the drone image with the algal image, which will fade in and out. And I'd ask you to draw your attention in particular to the sand bank up there. The idea is that those that should be about a meter difference in elevation. So we should see the line of, of the sea moving a lot. We don't, the water level's about the same. So that's another piece of evidence that low tidal level here is not controlled by the tide. This is a ponded, uh, environment. So they aren't underwater. They're ponded. They're not underwater. I've said that. Right, so it's, are these artifacts in situ? Now the, the general argument is that the artifacts, but, um, whether we're talking about that small site that we've looked at or the site in the on the edge of that big channel, which we'll get to, um, that the artifacts were discarded on land and then they were drowned by the sea level rise and they were not moved since that they were discarded. So, boringly, let's just make sure we understand in situ. If you're an archeologist and you find um, artifacts in situ, 
that's a great thing because it means that you can rule out um, uh, the natural processes so that you can gain a good cultural interpretation of what the archaeology might mean. So if you're wanting to get to that cultural interpretation, which is what archaeology is about, are in situ means in its original position. And there's some more words which mean in its original position. So but the key here is that the study of material culture means is then used to reflect human culture. So we need to be able to rule out the fact that these artifacts have been moved. So if artifacts have been moved by either human forces or by natural forces, then they're no longer in situ. I'm sorry, that's probably of no use to you whatsoever, but it's important to realize the significance to the archeological community. So critical question is, can movement of the coastal artifacts be ruled out? And remember, we've got these four questions, which we can broadly take in order. And we'll take the first one first. Can we look at hydrodynamic processes and ask whether this means that the artifacts are not in situ? So logically speaking, we can ask that question. We can get a no or a yes. And then we can ask the next question. Can the movement of artifacts be ruled out by people? No or yes. Can we rule it out at any time during the Holocene high stand by natural processes? No or yes. And then the fourth question. It's important to realize that of all the answers that we're going to arrive at, only one means that the artifacts can be in situ. So that requires, if we want to arrive here in confidence and prove uh, and, and make the best archaeological interpretations, we have to use logic very carefully, conduct a high quality investigation, which means that we can ask, ask, ask and answer each one of these questions convincingly and powerfully. So let's go to the bank of Flying Foam Passage to this edge of um, Dolphin Island. This is a color image, a DTM of Dolphin Island. Um, Highest astronomical tide is this black line. And we're moving across the intertidal zone to mean low water springs, this white line. LAT, by the way, is only just seawards. The, the, the seabed is quite steep there. But in any case, you can see that the intertidal zone in this environment is quite wide. It's about 200 to 250 meters. A couple of things I would like to point out to you. First of all, there is a well-documented Aboriginal stone quarry here, a stone quarry which was used to generate lithic artifacts, are, which are colored on this diagram in yellow. And the lithic artifacts are clumped here, and so there's some more up here. The pink artifacts are historic artifacts, which we're not really concerned with today, but nonetheless, um, they are relevant. So, reminding ourselves that that's what some of these lithic artifacts looked like. In this paper, the authors justified these artifacts as being in situ because two reasons. First of all, they said that the artifacts were not abraded and the edges were not rounded. Remember that we're only talking about whatever transport, whether it be natural or human, of a few tens of meters. Oh, my cat, I'm sorry. Um, Secondly, their argument is that, quotes, we would expect any movement of artifacts to reflect the longshore direction of marine currents. I'm not sure they knew what they meant by longshore direction of marine currents, but they mean something about sediment transport, I think. Let's, let's investigate this. And to investigate that, we have to do a little bit more on the modern hydrodynamic processes of flying foam passage and what might be going on on the coast. So, Reminding ourselves, we've got a macrotidal environment with tides, spring tides of five meters tidal range. We have measurements of tidal currents that go up to two meters per second. We have a daily wave regime driven a lot by the onshore and offshore winds. Because this is quite a dry environment, it can get enormously hot during the day. So we get a very strong sea breeze in the evenings and a reasonably strong land breeze in the mornings. We also have a seasonal wave regime through the seasonal southerlies and southwesterlies uh, in the dry season. We also have episodic 
tropical cyclones in the wet season, and I'm not going to talk about tsunamis today, but I promise to do another talk on those another time, if you'll let me. Tidal currents, first of all. Lots of measurements, as I said, but I'm just going to use a model here that corresponds with all the measurements very well to just show the elevation change in colour between Nickel Bay to the right and Mermaid Sound to the left. So the yellows here are high water and the greens on, over here are lower and they're about a metre lower. This is for the ebb tide, which we remember flows out and to the south and west. Okay, And these drive fast currents through these passages, which we'll come to later. And on the flood tide, unsurprisingly, we've got high elevations on the west. We've got this big barrier of this peninsula, fast currents through the passages generated by the high gradients and lower water levels around here. So we've got tidal elevation changes between these two embayments of about a metre on spring tides. Elevation changes along the archipelago of only about 30 centimetres. Right, so we've got fast tidal currents. Let's look at something really basic in terms of sedimentology. Here's the um, beach and intertidal zone. These black areas are mangroves. All these dots are where the artifacts are. You can see that the intertidal zone is mostly unvegetated. The subtidal zone is completely unvegetated. It's almost sediment free, in fact. But just from a, a, a simple first principles point of view, this has to be persistent sediment mobility here in an environment where seagrass and mangroves grow so quickly in favourable environments. So we've got a lack of intertidal mangroves and other vegetation, which tells us persistent sediment mobility is happening in this environment. Secondly, we were a great resource for the entire coastline of Australia. There are annual data of where mean sea level was since 1988. And we can talk about how this was done perhaps in questions if you're interested. But that means that we can look at 30 years of shoreline changes around the whole of Australia. Here we're concerned in Flying Foam Passage and at this particular site. So I've just plotted some of the lines on here which represent lines. This one's from the year 2000. That one out there is from the year 1999, etc. I've dated a few. And that's the variation that we find across this site, up to 50 metres up here, more than 50 metres down here, and up to about 30 metres down here. But that, so it means at this site, the location of mean sea level has varied by more than 50 metres, including in areas where there are artefacts. So that change in elevation of the shoreline must have influenced artefact mobility. And that's just over 30 years, not over seven or eight or nine thousand. Finally, um, waves. Um, I was talking about the regional waves from the southwest and sometimes the sea breeze from the north northeast, or it could be a cyclone driven one. These are the fetches that we might have which approach this site at Dolphin Island of about 20 kilometers from the southwest and about eight or nine from the north northeast. If we just do some boring equations from the US Army Corps of Engineers manual that you, some of you will be familiar with, we can do simple calculations to show the heights of the wave and the periods of the waves that would be generated if we have 30 knots, which is perfectly normal in a windy season, um, with a fetch of only 10 kilometers. Refracted onto the intertidal zone, these are easily able to move sand, just easily able to move sand. And that's consistent with what we find in the sediments, of course. So what that means is that we've looked at only question one. Can we rule out movement of coastal artifacts by modern hydrodynamic processes? Yeah, I think, I think, I think we can. All the information is consistent. Inconsistent. These intertidal sediments are continually mobilized today. The artifacts here cannot be in situ. Let's move just slightly offshore, down the steep sides of this passage into 14 meters of water where this single artifact was found. And it was found in a depression in the passage bed. I'll just show you some of those depressions now. That was some uh, multi-beam data 
and side scan sonar data that was collected. I'll amplify it a little bit for you. Here's a couple of the depressions, another one here where the artifact was, another one here. This is what the depression in question looks like um, in 3D view and going from A to B. Um, that's the the symmetry that we have going across that depression. So it's got a relief of something like four, four and a half meters or so. Quite steep sided. That's where the artifact was found. And these two papers both introduced this artifact and they claimed that this artifact could be justified as being in situ for three reasons. Firstly, because quotes of the artifacts posi position and condition. Um, they didn't go beyond that, so I'm not exactly sure what that means. Secondly, they said that there was no evidence for Paleo River through the passage. Um, we might come back to that later. I, I don't think that that's necessarily very important. Perhaps it was in their minds that they were explaining that the artifact couldn't have been moved by a river, perhaps. As you'll see, that's not relevant. The third assertion was that once the channel was inundated by sea level rise, flows in the channel were relatively weak, that's a direct quote, and unable to move sediment. Well, and they led, those three things led them to this assertion, and I might give you a few seconds just to read their quote. Okay, assuming you've read that, they're saying that they can't be moved from a shoreline into that position by water. Um, let's examine this. Well, first of all, and most obviously, we know from the modern measurements and the modeling which I've showed you, but the measurements are the key, that we know that tidal currents through this passage at that point attain a one meter per second routinely and they actually go up to 1.8 meters per second. This is just a plot chosen 2011. I'll tell you, show you why in a moment. These are the spring neap cycles of the current speeds at that point at 14 meters um, uh, pulled out one meter above the bed at that point. And so you can see that there are very fast flows routinely at this in this environment. Um, I'll point out something else in a moment. So we know that um, uh, from uh, modeling work or just using simple calculations that tidal currents at the bed of that magnitude can easily initiate movement of particles between three and 10 centimeters in diameter and actually cause the material if that material is sliding or rolling across a hard seabed, which it is in this case. Thirdly, cyclones enhance current speeds. They enhance current speeds because when you have a, a wind that blows along the shelf, it tends to um, bank water up against one side of an archipelago and enhance the currents that move through that archipelago. Um, there's a tiny example here of a, a, a fairly small cyclone that happened in January 2011. Those are the couple of days when the cyclone was around. And that increased the normal tidal currents at that time by about 30 centimetres per second. So they enhance current speeds, especially to the southwest, because that's the, 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 the nature of the dominant flows that are generated by um, clockwise circulating cyclones as they approach the coast. And finally, and I won't go into this in detail, but just if you, this is a very deep channel, 14 meters. So we can imagine quite easily, I think, that during inundation, we'd have had a body of sand perhaps here, and perhaps a body of sand up here, and a beach moving both southwards and another beach moving northwards. Eventually they join, and eventually they're broken by the rising sea level, at which point the fast tidal flows begin and they scour out the channel. We know that there are vast quantities of sand, sand in Nickel Bay and in Mermaid Sound, but there is an absence of sand throughout Flying Foam Passage. So it's been scoured. So I should just go back and finish the point here. That that, that, that means there is every possibility for the artifact found in the base of that um, depression to be um, uh, to have originated 
along the coastline at that nearby site or indeed anywhere to the north or even to the northeast in Nickel Bay. The power of those currents acting over seven, eight or nine thousand years would have been enormous. Back to this little passage um, in Cape Brugier and this paper by B2020. Um, I want to think now sedimentologically about the pattern of the artifacts that we've got and their distribution. Here the red ones are the ones they've said are permanently submerged and the yellow ones they've said are intertidal. So that's, I think we can say they're all intertidal, but nonetheless, these are the different quotes they use to describe that distribution. And they're not all consistent, but I'll just give you a few seconds to, um, to read them for yourselves. With regard to the third one, I should point out that the Calcaronite Terrace, uh, they mean this terrace down here, um, which houses 455 um, artifacts, which um, I'm not going to go into today. They're not really part of this story. Okay, so with that in mind, as a set of ontologists, I would think, well, what, what can we do with this data? Well, first of all, we can do the obvious thing that we did to the previous site. We can have a look at the last 30 years of measured coastal changes. So I picked out a few points along this, this area, and I've just put a time series for the last 30 years. They all do pretty much the same thing. That they built up towards about 1998, there were three or four years of erosion of between eight to 10 meters, and then they've fiddled around a bit since then. The point is that we've had eight or 10 meters of change in just 30 years. How much change might there have been in seven, eight or 9,000 years? We don't know. The idea that you can uh, assume that artifacts either on land or in the channel have not been affected by such coastal erosion is I think probably a sedimentologically untenable one. But we can also do another thing. My sedimentary brain says, well, perhaps we can look at artifact size and how can we use that? So helpfully in that paper, they did present a map of artifact size. Here's the scale, two to four centimeters, some of the tiny ones and some of the biggest ones up to 42 to 43, 44 centimeters. So my head would say, well, how best to use this information? Presumably we would test the spatial gradients of these artifacts and we compare them with the spatial gradients that we would find in the natural surrounding sediments and any sediment transport pathways that we might infer from things like bed forms or the internal structure and age of the sand deposits to the northeast and southwest. A um, bit of a cautionary tale and perhaps a teaching aid. I don't think you do this. Um, I don't think you just plot size of artifact in centimeters against elevation. They've said that because they mean elevation of an artifact from mean sea level down to two meters or just slightly below two meters, and then put a straight line through it and write that a lack of a correlation demonstrates the absence of a relationship between depth and artifact size. Uh, I don't think that's sedimentologically defensible. Now, hey, there's an opportunity for sedimentologists to get into this data if it ever becomes available. So, and in this paper, they used the distribution pattern that they described and the plot above. They argued that it, this proves a hypothesis of differential water transport. Um, I'm not sure what that means, but they said that therefore the pattern they found is primary and represents human use. And so we can use it to make cultural interpretations. Of course, there's loads of problems with that, which I'm sure you um, I can realize from what I've told you already, the tidal range, the fact we're dealing with very coarse particles, the fact that we haven't looked at episodic events. So we haven't really considered realistic physical processes. And the, any implicit, implicit hypothesis that they had has ignored the prospect of it, the artifacts essentially being a lag deposit. Um, it's ignored the fact that we've got 7,000 years or more of processes. And I won't go into this in detail, but we've got no age for the artifacts. The age of the artifacts they've purely inferred from their elevation with respect to a sea level curve. So the hypothesis is, I think, invalid. And their conclusion, I think, 
is invalid too. So these artifacts are not in situ. So we're getting, getting towards the end now, um, but just to summarize, for the arguments of B2020 to be correct, there are five requirements. I'll let you read the first four, which will be obvious to you, I think, by now. So essentially, artifacts discarded in the channel are not moved by natural or human processes for over 7,000 years. The other thing that's required is, given that some of these artifacts are permanently submerged and therefore presumably would be subject to marine growth throughout 7,000 years or more, how do you explain inactive marine growth for more than 7,000 years? The five dates that they have had on these artifacts all return to modern ages. In fact, they state, because active marine growth is present on most artifacts. So we don't know how these are, old these artifacts are. So of these five requirements, none of them were tested effectively, but for the arguments to be true, all of these need to be true. They aren't. So um, I, I hope that this has sort of shown that sedimentary principles on coastal and marine geoarchaeology can really help. So the obvious thing is, how do we do it better? Well, clearly we need to test more rigorously for things about in situ using questions, really fundamental questions like this. We need to ask the key questions using defensible oceanography and sediment transport. And of course, we need to consider processes operating over many, many millennia. Any sedimentologist would investigate. Logically, we test things. We would certainly treat artifacts as the sedimentary particles they are, and we would date things well. We would date the context, the deposits, and the artifacts themselves. So if you're a sedimentologist out there who isn't involved in coastal archaeology, and especially coastal marine archaeology, I think there's an enormous um, opportunity for you to get involved and contribute really useful sedimentary approach to coastal marine archaeology. The other thing, of course, is that many archaeologists like things being in situ. So if you are involved in marine archaeology at the moment, and you turn out to find out that your artifacts are not in situ, um, remain happy, because there is still lots that they can reveal about the processes involved, which then can contribute to our understanding of possible cultural interpretations. So. The key question is, can we be confident the artifact scatters in the Dampier archipelago are in situ, and I should add, underwater? And the answer is, I think, no, we can't. Northwest Australia must wait a little bit longer for its first in situ underwater cultural heritage site. And that's me done. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, so the chat is now open. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat and make sure you share it with everybody and let us know where you're watching from. Um, but given that there's not a ton of people on, I would assume that you're going to get lots of emails after the presentation uh, once it's posted online. Um, so we have our first question from Joanna in Poland. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. What is the lithology of the artifacts? I might get Ingrid to answer this one. Uh, they're all a rare day site, so a sort of a granodiorite type deposit. So the artifacts underwater match the artifacts uh, that you find on land. Um, again, that's another interesting aspect of one of the articles that they used um, a portable XRF to try and differentiate the artifacts on land versus the ones underwater and argued that the high calcium ratio, high cal calcium and strontium ratio of the ones underwater implied that they were of a different mineralogy. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh because um, it, it's uh, portable XRF has a very narrow range, it's only a few millimetres, so they were clearly measuring just um, the 
marine, marine growth, growth and, uh, that were in the, in, on the marine artifacts. So there is no difference between the artifacts on land or underwater. They are all rhyodacite. They are all of the same mineralogy. There is no difference at all. Interesting. Our next question is from, from Stephen in England. Uh, great presentation, thanks. Sorry if you already mentioned this. Um, for example, in the Celtic cultural water sites or off sacrifices are common, there would be considered to be in situ. Would such an interpretation change anything? Hmm, that's interesting. I have no idea. What do you think? If they were deliberately put there, Hmm. They haven't moved since they were put there. That is the point. Yeah, so, so, so um, I, don't, I don't think so, Stephen, is the answer. Uh, because however they got there, it's assumed that they were put there deliberately uh, as an offering. Um, the argument still is that they remained there for seven, eight, nine thousand years and haven't been moved by um, uh, processes since that time. So, um, I, and I think that's probably an unsustainable argument. You might also argue with the question if people coming along later during historic times, because this was a place where there was a lots of indentured labour, people were actually forced to work on the um, pearl, the pearling industry in the area. Uh, and so they were indentured during the off season. You could argue, well, if seeing a huge horde of artifacts, large artifacts, why people wouldn't have reused them and then again discarded them. That is still a, a form of, of cultural um, use and, and discard. So, so it's perfectly possible that these are only a few hundred years old. Exactly, yes. Uh, and therefore, are they in situ from the time that someone threw them away in the water? Um, yeah, that's not entirely impossible either, but yeah. there is just yeah, other extenuating circumstances. If, 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 if they were dated effectively, then we might be able to uh, uh, address that. At the moment, the assertion is that they're many thousands of year old, yeah. which is a big issue, I think. All right. Our next question is again from Joanna. So what do you mean by in situ? If the artifacts were transported over a short distance, they wouldn't be abraded, but they're still from another location. Yeah, well, that's that, um, and that's that almost a how long is a piece of string, isn't it? I completely agree with the question. I, I guess that, that um, this goes to the, the interaction of um, how you actually interpret as I see it anyway, from a sedimentary point of view, how do you interpret a, a, um, uh, a scatter of artifacts in cultural terms anyway? Right? Now, if presumably they were a beautiful circle that had holes between them and there was once a nice building there that you might find in Northern Scotland or something, then I can see that uh, if, if they were in that perfect circle, we, could have a, we got a great cultural interpretation. And maybe there's something like that occurring underwater. Who, who knows? Um, such a, 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 um, an apparently random scatter like that. Uh, it's, it's hard to think of, and I'm not the right person to think of, a cultural interpretation of that type of scatter. I'm, well, I'm might, jabbering here. You might take their interpretation. Their, their interpretation was that people sat in that depression uh, and used the artifacts as they were sitting there in that depression and left them there after they left. Um, I, from a cultural perspective, I struggle to understand why people would sit in a depression rather than on the sand dunes and in the breeze and away from the mossies and stuff that you get in this region. Um, but yes, the question is, you know, how, how, what is the distance of in situ? Uh, we're, we're challenging their definition rather than anybody else's. It's, their definition was that they were sitting there in that depression. So therefore they are in situ in that depression from the time they left. So uh, our own interpretation is that, yes, we do believe that the artifacts were originated from um, material that was on land 
potentially in situ on land and then transported into the water. Um, does that make them in situ? Well, we would argue not because they're out of context. Um, but, but having said that, we're actually unable to test that anyway because the nature of the data on land and of, uh, in the water is completely different and they haven't been compared, they haven't been treated as one body of data and then tested to see whether statistically there is anything different. And they haven't been tested in a way where you are testing a particular suite of processes, right? So it could be that the stuff on land has been derived from the stuff that's now in water or vice versa, or it's all come along the coast. We don't know. And so, I guess what we're saying is we can test some very basic things and come to a conclusion. If you want to go and test things further, you've got to do have a lot more information available to you. Is that, so, is that okay, Joanna? Do you think that then there's an, not, uh, there would be more sites around the world or around Australia that need to be reinterpreted because of these coastal interactions? Mm, don't know. I don't know. I haven't really looked. <laughs> That's my answer. <laughs> I, think, I think if you, um, um, well, see, one of the big, one of the big issues about, for example, northwestern Australia, but also many cultural sites in the tropics and subtropics, is that you've got hurricanes or typhoons mm -hmm. or cyclones. Mm -hmm. So, as well as the day-to-day -day periodic processes and the annual processes from the seasons, you've also got these episodic high intensity, high energy events, which when you're talking about coarse artifacts are perhaps the most important ones, but they're equally the ones of which you are least confident in uh, being able to ascribe the, the past variations of and the specific dynamics of at a particular site that you're interested in. It really makes a difference whether the winds in the, in the two hours before the cyclone crosses the coast, whether it's five kilometers to your east or five kilometers to your west, that makes a huge difference to, to what potentially is the sediment transport associated at your potential uh, uh, cultural site. So it's a, it's a big problem. Yeah. Big unknown. Yeah. Fun thing to think. Our next um, question is from Stephen. It's more of a statement than a question. It, is, it is clear that there is often a disconnect between the sedimentology and the archaeology communities. There is so much knowledge that is common in one camp, but unknown to the other community. Very few of us have a foot in both camps. Maybe it is our time to draw our communities together at a meeting or in some other way to help share our niche common knowledge. Here, here. Look forward to or organizing a meeting with you, Stephen, in the near future. It's, that is how geoarchaeology as a discipline has uh, started, and Paul Goldberg is probably the champion of um, the person who has integrated both archaeology and, and geology. Um, I would also add that there is scope to also overlap with chemistry and biology because uh, they also have huge um, input and overlaps with what we do as well. Um, from the analytical side. Yeah, the analytical abs side. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Interesting. And, 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 and from a, sorry, just to interrupt, but I was <laughs> going to say, but from, a, from an Indigenous perspective, um, their view is very holistic and that everything connects with everything else. Um, I came from a biology and geology background into archaeology, so I've never thought any other way. They've always been connected. Um, and I struggle to understand why people don't see it that way. Um, it's, it is, I think, almost a naturalist, an old school naturalist point of view that if we can go back to the way people used to think in those early days of science. Um, people looked at things from a number of different angles. Um, yeah, so they all, there's definitely yeah, scope for overlap, but sedimentology uh, and sediments are fundamental. I've, 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 there's a wonderful paper um, about the point that uh, archaeologists dig dirt. So why don't archaeologists understand dirt 
and I would still say a lot of archaeologists don't understand dirt and there are a yep. lot of problems that are, arise because of it. So we have a lot to learn <laughs> um, mm. from sedimentologists. So, yeah. And I think just to finalise that, I completely agree with that. And, and at the moment, of course, because of the ease and availability and reduced cost of the marine survey instrumentation, nowadays it used to be only hundreds of thousands of dollars or pounds or whatever and now it's a few tens and something you can fit on the back of a reasonably small boat and use yourself the amount of data and the opportunities for doing sh relatively shallow water marine and coastal archaeology are enormous and it's beginning now and so and and so that disconnect between understanding process and past change with what you find on the seabed now or hope to find on the seabed now it, it, Stephen's absolutely right there is a there is a big disconnect now that's probably always been there in archaeology but I think it's amplified now in the marine sphere very cool maybe you'll have an opportunity from this uh talk to expand that <laughs> Hope <so>. hopefully <laughs> all right well uh thank you very much for your presentation and thanks everybody for attending um, make sure you check out next week's seminar at our regular time, 4 p.m. UK time, when Genovia della Porta will be talking about microbial carbonates. So I hope to see you all there.